Hey everybody. Hey. Uh, my, my name is Joshua Kane. Okay. Uh, I got my PhD at UCLA recently, and now I work at this place called the Institute for Advanced Conscious Studies in Santa Monica, California. Okay. Um, and I'm going to try to tell you as much as I can in the time that we have about focus ultrasound for neuromodulation. So I'm going to try to best summarize the whole field and everything you need to know the best I can, which is going to be really hard, right? So at any point, stop me and ask if something's confusing, because I don't really know where the gaps might be, okay? So, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you, you know, what on earth I'm talking about, the basic history, what has been done before, and then the challenges that still exist. Okay, so what do I mean when I say uh, focus ultrasound neuromodulation? Oh, man. This thing away. Uh, let this go away. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, everybody is aware of ultrasounds, right? In ultrasound imaging, so it's these high frequency sound waves above the range of human hearing, right? That we use for things like fetal imaging. What most people don't know is that we've known since the 1950s that it can also induce uh, reversible neuromodulation, right? So this guy named Fry did a few experiments where he uh, exposed the cat LGN, uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, uh, to ultrasound, and it reduced the amplitude of a visual evoked potential in a reversible way. So it's not causing damage, it's not doing anything permanent, but inducing this, this temporary neuromodulation. Uh, interesting note, they kind of just, he did a few studies, and everyone was like, okay, interesting. And then it just it just stops, right? So no one even touched it until the 2000s. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about is like this this big reemergence that's happening in this field uh, in recent years. So uh, when I say this, right, when I introduce this topic to most people, uh, first question I get is usually like, how does this work? And the short answer is we don't completely know yet, right? Like most things, like all things in science, right? Now that's not that crazy because uh, we also don't know exactly how like uh, TMS works, right? Transcranial magnetic stimulation. We know a lot, but you know, we don't know exactly how it works, right? And the same thing here. So um, it has to do something, it has to do with something with the uh, just shaking of neurons, okay? So sound is just pressure waves and what's happening is just at a really high frequency shaking neurons and everything inside them, okay? Um, so some people, it used to be thought that maybe the major mechanism is... Yeah, I brauche noch zwei Minuten. <laughs> Can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Was that a question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so, uh, you know, people used to think what's happening is it's physically opening up ion channels, right? Uh, there's actually mechanoreceptors expressed even in the brain for some reason, okay? So we thought that might be the main mechanism. Uh, that certainly probably happens to some extent, but the major theory nowadays is uh, that ultrasound creates little bubbles in fluid. We know that it does, called cavitation, okay? So high enough intensity ultrasound creates little bubbles in fluid and water, and that happens in your brain too when we expose it to ultrasound, okay? And what we think is happening is it creates these little bubbles in between the two layers of the membrane of your neurons, and this just widens the membrane slightly, okay? And that widening is separates physically the inside and the outside of the cell, which are of different charges, and it ends up changing the capacitance of the cell, right? So it ends up changing in a complex way, the electrical properties of the cell and making action potentials more likely, okay? So that is the predominant theory for why this works nowadays, but we aren't 100% sure. Probably in a few years, it will become very clear. Okay. So what do I mean by focused ultrasound, right? So the ultrasound that comes out of an imaging device is just a flat wave, right? That comes out, bounces back, but uh, it's more useful for our purposes to have a, a focal point, okay? So we have maybe a curved element. So the thing that generates the ultrasound is curved and uh, it focuses all the energy onto a single point. So what we get is a point inside the head that's a much higher intensity, 
than, um, than the intervening tissue, okay? So we can target, we can apply a relatively high energy to a point inside the head, like the thalamus here, right? Without impacting, at least to the same degree, the intervening cortical tissue between the transducer and the target, okay? It's like a magnifying glass, if that helps. So um, this has been used for a decade or two now in uh, an ablative surgery. So this is much higher intensity, okay? Maybe a hundred thousand times as intense, okay? And, um, and they'll focus onto a single voxel size. So it can burn out a single one by one by one millimeter area to burn out a little tumor or to help with things like movement disorders, okay? Um, so, you know, that idea has been around. It's the same idea here. It's just a lower intensity. So we're not causing damage. Okay. And it's a little bit simpler how we'd use it. We just use a single element instead of this big helmet that you need to be bolted to. Okay. Okay. So, uh, before I start getting into the nitty gritty details and physics and stuff, what does this look like? Right? Like what? <laughs> This gives you a, kind of a, some perspective here. So, right, we have this, this uh, device, right? It can look different ways, right? But it generates ultrasound in a focal point and you affix it to the head somehow, okay? It can't go through air. If it goes through air, it bounces off the air, like attenuates it dramatically, right? So you have to have it aimed precisely and affixed to the head with gel, filling any gap, okay? Because it can't go through air. Okay, and what you get is you pass, if you do this right, you pass energy through, through the flesh, through the bone, and you generate a little focal point inside the head. Now, it should be noted, and we'll talk about this in more detail, that bone is a major barrier. So we have to understand how much of a barrier it is and try to account for this, right? So these are simulations I've run. So on the top, this is just running it in water. Right, so everything's identical with running in water, and you know you get this like idealized little focal point, right? But when you go through skull, it uh, well, it kind of deforms the focus, right? Smashes it, makes it a little bigger, right? Depends how it's hitting the bone. Uh, a lot of the energy bounces off the skull, right, and is absorbed by the skull. It might attenuate it by uh, fifty to ninety percent, depending on a lot of things. Okay. Um, and it tends to also retract it towards the head a little bit, right? So if you get a transducer of a certain depth, when you go through the skull, it's actually a little shorter. And we can, we'll get back to that stuff if you guys want details on that. Uh, this is like a modern transducer, right? So there's only a few companies that make this thing. These are the transducers that you guys have here, for instance, okay? The bottom left, that's uh, the face of it. That's where the old sound comes out of. And we'll often put like a little gel pad on it which uh, makes it easier to affix to the head with no air bubbles, okay? So that's what that looks like. So again, it, this can be a really precise thing, okay? We'll, we'll talk about the dimensions of the focal point and stuff, but um, because of that, you need to use a, you know, you need to use a good system for targeting because you want to be as precise as, as you can be. So often we'll use a neural navigation system like this. This is a brain site and you guys have one of those here. Okay, it's, it's created for TMS, but we modified it for ultrasound, okay. Looks like that, you might strap a subject to the chair and then use fiducials, registering their head to an MRI of theirs, right? Registering the transducer. And then in real time, you can target even very small nuclei or parts of nuclei, okay? So, um, so, you know, as, as, as I've said, we can't go through air. So we got to we got to do all these things, right? We got to get the hair out of the way as much as we can. Hair can trap air bubbles, um, right? We got to have gel. It's got to be targeted to millimeter precision. Uh, so it can be quite a lot of setup. So this is just a, this is a time lapse of my, of a study I'm, I'm starting soon with my, my RAs um, running this, okay? So as you can see, it can be quite a lot. Okay, so given that, given that it can be a lot, like there's challenges, right? There's a lot of challenges. It's a new technology. Not a lot of people use it. You got to 3D print a lot of parts to make it all work, right? 
why do we want to use this thing? What are the benefits? And uh, well, the answer is because it, it affords us a lot of things that other, other forms of neuromodulation just simply cannot do, right? So we can imagine different techniques existing on this, this plane, you know, with the axes of spatial precision and the depth of their influence. What we want is something that's really precise in the top right corner that we can, we can put anywhere in the brain, but we don't necessarily have that without surgery, right? We can use TDCS, which just arcs electricity through the brain. We can go pretty deep, but it's, it's not spatially precise at all most of the time. Okay, TMS is more precise, but I'm sure most of you know, it can just hit the outside of the brain. So we can just hit the cortical mantle with TMS, right? What we want is where deep brain stimulation is, right? Something that's precise that we can put anywhere in the brain. The unfortunate thing is that you can't do DBS to study meditation or, you know, right? Or cognitive functioning, right? And healthy people. So an answer could be this whole focus ultrasound thing, right? Because it's relatively speaking, much more precise in these techniques. It's, it be, depending on how you do it, it, it gets close to the precision of DBS and it can be done non-invasively, focused anywhere in the brain, right? So think of all the potential there, all the deep cortical nuclei that have never, ever, ever been modulated in healthy people ever, okay? Now, um, it, just to note, it can be done in concert with EEG and MRI. There's some artifacts to be dealt with. I won't go into the details, but they can they can be dealt with okay um okay so i'm gonna move on um, i want to express how novel this is uh, how new all this is right this is mentions of tms versus ultrasound you can't even see the ultrasound right okay but ultrasound's been rapidly advancing in recent years okay so it's on this kind of exponential trend um like I said, just did, this wasn't a thing that existed until very recently, right? The first use in humans was in, in 2014 there, okay? And this is where I exist, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I probably published 10 to 20% of all of the, all of the papers in human uh, fuss, okay? So it, the, the reason I'm telling you this is because like, you know, there's a lot, you can't just buy stuff for this, right? You kind of got to like put it together at this point. It's almost ready for uh, prime time, but like not quite yet. Okay. So uh, ultrasound is a wave. It's a sound wave, right? And so we should talk a little bit about uh, the properties of that sound wave. So this can get like, you know, this gets like a little physics-y. So just bear with me. Um, and there can be a lot here, but uh, you should know the basics, right? So check out this thing. This is an example of a parameter set that I use, right? Um, it's more complicated than just a sound wave, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this down. So first and foremost, it just is a sound wave, right? It's just a sine wave coming out at a certain frequency. So that's the lowest level here. Um, the frequency can change, but well, okay. So it's sound wave first and foremost, and it can be at a certain intensity, okay? So the amplitude can change and that's important for things like safety and efficacy. But you'll notice these crazy things here, um, right? It's often not applied continuously. Sometimes it is, but it's often applied in pulses, okay? So we started, we started doing this because, or like as an, an analogy from deep brain simulation or TMS where pulses are super important to what we do to the neurons, right? The frequency of these pulses and such, okay? So that's why we started doing this. And um, there's a whole range of things, right? Um, but I wanna direct your attention more towards this thing in the top right called the duty cycle. Okay, so, so the duty cycle is in any given period of time, like for a second, how long is the ultrasound on? So if it's in these little pulses, it's not on all the time, right? It's on for a little bit. Here it's on for a half a millisecond, and then it's off for quite a bit, right? So it's on for half a millisecond, it does that half, or it does that 100 times a second, which means that it's on for 5% of the time, okay? 50 milliseconds every, every second. 5% of the time, duty cycle, okay? Um, 
totally by chance, right? We've discovered that uh, if anything, that seems more important than these things, right? Like that duty cycle seems more important than the frequency of the pulses. Frequency of the pulses might matter a little bit, but the field's going towards that as being really important. I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, hold that in your mind, right? Hold the duty cycle thing in your mind, but also note how high dimensional this parameter space is, right? So there's a lot we don't know. People might say, why don't you just map the whole parameter space in animals? And it's because it's like, you know, a million conditions because it's, it's all these things and some other things I haven't mentioned, like how long do you stimulate for, right? What brain region are you targeting? It might be cell type specific. Okay. Yeah. Simple question. Um, so it's one essentially one five millisecond pulse per ten second block. Yeah. So it's a it's half a millisecond. Excuse me, half a millisecond. Yeah. Oh yeah. Per, but then you do it once and then there's a ten second. No, it's uh it it happens a hundred times a second. So it's a hundred oh, okay. it's a hundred hertz. That's yeah. So there's some off period. And then you have sensitivity over four ten seconds where you're not pulsing at all. Oh, I'm sorry. So I didn't explain this. You're right. Yeah, yeah. So I should have. This is. I should have cut this out probably. So even on top of that, right? You can turn it on for 20 seconds or 30 seconds and then off. This is what I do. I do 30 seconds on and off in the MRI for a block design. Okay, but that's. It's not necessarily something you have to do. So that's why it was. Uh, well, just to have a block design, right? So then I can look at. Yeah, I can look at the. the yeah, the changes on and off, right? So that's a, a common thing I've done in the MRI, right? Um, and the initial thought also was that it might be a little safer because it kind of like gives some time to, for everything to relax or heat to dissipate. But we know now that it, it doesn't matter. It's fine. You could, you could turn it on for five minutes or 10 minutes and it's fine. Okay. So oh, remember this, uh, this duty cycle, okay? Now, um, in recent years, right, ever since this like sort of landmark 2016 uh, computational paper, right, uh, people have become aware that this duty cycle thing is super important. Um, let's see my mouse here, yes, okay. So I know this has two dimensions. This is an intensity and duty cycle. So it's a little complicated, right? But if you just take the intensities that are realistic, which is maybe here, to here, right? Any less, especially in humans through the thick skull is gonna not do anything anymore and you're getting into kind of dangerous territory, okay? And you'll notice all the publications are there anyway, these references. So we can kind of take intensity out and um, what you notice is that low duty cycles tend to be inhibitory and high duty cycles tend to be excitatory. So they, uh, what they did is they created a computational model of uh, cell interaction, right? That suggests this and it lines up perfectly with the publications that existed at the time. And since then, a lot of them have lined up with that too. So I've published three MRI studies in this range, okay? And um, all of them suggest that the targeted tissue was inhibited during the ultrasound. Okay, so things continue to line up with this theory. So remember that how this works is that we're generating action potentials. How do we get inhibition, right? And that's because we may preferentially excite inhibitory or excitatory neurons. So these people noticed uh, that inhibitory neurons, because of you know, their properties, tend to accumulate this charge differential and hold it for longer. So if you have a little pulse and then you have a big off period, the excitatory pyramidal cells will just dissipate the change that's instilled in them, right? Whereas the inhibitory interneurons will like hold on to it, okay? And so it builds. And what you get is you have more of an influence, you have more action potentials caused in the inhibitory neurons with a low duty cycle because of the off periods and that generates inhibition. On the other side of things, right? If it's on all the time, we're just exciting everything, the pyramidal cells uh, went out, okay? That's in cortex and uh, in thalamus, it's surprisingly similar for some reason, even though it's different cells, like the same, kind of roughly the same thing. 
Um, so this model is built on, again, cortex thalamus, other brain regions we know less about. There's less data on it. And, you know, there's different cell types and everything. From what I've seen, what I've done, it, it tends to be this general pattern still. But, you know, one should proceed with caution of hitting something that is a totally different brain region. Like, you don't know, you don't know the valence of the stimulation. Okay. Any questions about that? So that concludes the kind of mechanistic physics -y part. I'm going to start talking about what has been done really briefly. So first off, uh, animal work. So because there is like a, there is a bit of a safety concern with this, uh, especially early on when we didn't know anything. And so a lot of the early stuff in like the 2000s, 2007, right? Um, was done in animals, right? And it's all been all been basic science. What do the parameters do? How long does it last? Is it safe? That sort of thing. Okay, for instance, this is a great uh, 2013 paper and uh, really demonstrates the potential efficacy of ultrasound. So they're applying this to the rat's motor cortex and you get a contralateral flick. Okay, so you get, you get a tail flick or, or a, a hind limb flick, right? And you can see it on the, the EMG. Okay, and they use this to test a whole bunch of parameters. There's like this, this uh, obvious observation of neuromodulation, and then they could, they could vary all these parameters and then see the success rate of generating a hind tail kick. Okay, so so this is intensity mapping, right? And this is in brain because their skulls are so thin. It's essentially the same thing. So what you get from this is that oh, you need about two point five or so watts to, in the brain to generate most of the time neuromodulation at this level. For instance, here's another more recent study, twenty twenty two. That's really really good. It's like very detailed, right? Um, and they did it in sheep. Uh, same sort of thing. What's nice is they have off-target uh, examples, right? So it's not about the ultrasound being on. It's not the sound it might generate. It's nothing with the bone conduction of sound or pressure waves or anything like that, that people might point to with the, the early animal studies, right? But instead, it definitely has to be direct neuromodulation. Okay. And uh, this study also really confirmed that duty cycle thing I'm talking about. So um, a lot of the animal studies look like this. Uh, there's also a similar one in pigs in 2017. Um, I'm putting it here because what they found, they found a similar thing here, right? So an effect on motor cortex, but if they move to the focus over just two millimeters, like between one and two millimeters, the effect disappears, right? So that's, that's enough off target, depending on your on your parameters here, that's the degree of accuracy that you can obtain sometimes, right, in cortex. And we'll talk about what affects these things. Okay, another question people have is how long does this last? Um, and there's a lot of evidence for the effect lasting past the simulation itself, like you see in TMS and other things, but there's a huge amount of variability. So we, we really, don't know what's affecting that yet. For instance, this EMG is lasting like a second. Um, there's really good uh, visual evoke potential study in rabbits from a while ago, consistently lasts about 10 minutes, right? And then I have some own, my own data in humans. And this is, this is from an image taken uh, after ultrasound um, about five or 10 minutes after, okay? So I don't know if it lasted longer, but I know it lasted, you know, I have some effect lasting at least five to 10 minutes after stimulation. And then there's been a recent, you know, flurry of papers from this uh, Cambridge or Oxford, Oxford group um, from all these people. And they show, cha they show behavioral changes and changes in connectivity on MRI, right? Uh, in macaque monkeys that lasts for uh, two hours. Right. And I know these people, and in some individuals, it's eight hours. So there's a huge amount of variability there. So we don't really know what leads to that, but as a general trend, this is like not statistic. Yeah, Julia? Yeah. Sorry, um, yeah. the, 
comparability is within one study? Between, between studies. studies. Between yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't know if it's individual differences or parameters. I think it's the parameters, yeah. yeah. But we just don't have enough data okay. to uh, to know what parameters are important. So, yeah. That said, is there some sort of consensus of at least the best practice that we've provided in offline, you know, the same thing offline? Yeah, so that's that's kind of what I'm I'm saying here is there's like there's only been so many studies, right? And these things may certainly be cell type specific or species specific, right? Because we don't know the mechanism. Is it transcriptional? Like it's got to be something like that that is is more permanent. So it certainly could be cell type specific. Okay, so there's just not enough data points. Um, in general, it seems like there's a trend towards like the higher intensity and the longer you stimulate, which kind of makes sense, right? It tends to last longer, okay? But this is, you know, there's just imagine seven data points here or something, right? Uh, with with a bunch of caveats, it's it's nothing you can really uh, say for certain now. Yeah, like some modern reviews will kind of say, well, it seems like that, right? That's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, like for instance, uh, what I've done a lot is I, I stimulate for a really long time, but it's at a low intensity, okay? And I see after effects. And then this monkey study or these monkey studies, they stimulate at a really high intensity, 10 times what I do, um, but only for 40 seconds and it lasts hours, right? Um, and interesting to note, there's still no histological damage or any evidence for a permanent effect here in the monkeys, even though it's 10 times what I do what I've done. Okay, so moving on to humans, a lot less there. I want to talk about everything, but there's not that much. So the first one was in 2014 by this guy, guy named uh, Win Ligon. And what he did was just simply uh, focus ultrasound onto the somatosensory cortex. And then he did a two point discrimination task. Okay, in the relevant area, I think the arm, okay. And he found interestingly that they are more sensitive during the ultrasound, okay? Um, so that was the first uh, behavioral effect, first effect of any sort uh, found in humans. This is, that's a simulation, by the way, that's not like MRI data or anything up there, uh, but that's what he estimates his uh, focal point would look like, okay? Since then, uh, there's, been, uh, there's been a few things, right? There's been a good, uh, good many things. Uh, for instance, like the 2017 paper is really cool. So what they did is they took EG, uh, put EG on one individual and you have them think, I'm going to move my left arm or my right arm, right? And you can decode that with EEG and then you can transmit it to someone who's wearing a helmet, right? With two ultrasound transducers on, and then it generates in the appropriate side, um, you know, ultrasound in the somatosensory cortex and they can feel it. So you can actually feel like a light tingling sensation in your hands. So, so supposedly they were able to do this sort of like really simple brain brain interface, really cool. The Korean study. Um, and then in uh, the last like five years, there's been a lot more emphasis or been some more emphasis on the subcortex because that's the real point of ultrasound. Like if you want to hit the cortex, you just use TMS for the most part, unless you need to be really precise, but why, right? Uh, and so this Ligon guy, again, uh, hit the thalamus, the somatosensory thalamus, and this time um, they were less sensitive to the two-point discrimination task. Um, at the same time, I was, I just published this, but at the same time I was running this data um, in healthy people, just blasting um, at rest in the MRI, uh, their globus pallidus and thalamus and seeing if I could uh, pick up a bold effect, which indeed I did. Okay, just uh, to kind of confirm the neuroactivity of this parameter set that I would use for later things. Is some of the device in the scanner or do you have to do it before and then this is in the scanner, yeah. So depending on the manufacturer, this one, this brain site uh, manufacturer, sorry, brain sonics manufacturer that makes the ones that we have here, that's safe in the MRI, yeah. So what this reflects is the different whole brain um, bold signal during 30 second ultrasound blocks compared to off blocks. So it was on, off, on, off, 
for 10 minutes in the scanner. We record the TRs manually, actually, in this one. And, um, and this is what came out. Okay. And, you know, I'm, there's a lot more details and stuff, of course, right? But I'm just uh, moving through it. Okay. Uh, but it's sorry, and I should say this reflects inhibition, right? This is a reduced bold signal during. <laughs> During the ultrasound, right, it's 5% duty cycle in line with that whole low duty cycle inhibition thing. Um, but there is amazing potential clinical applications for focus ultrasound. Think of all the diseases that might be helped or better understood if we could precisely, pretty selectively target deep brain areas, right, in healthy people or in people that can't undergo surgery. Someone has anxiety, you can turn their amygdala down, see what happens, right? They have depression, we hit their subgenual ACC, is something I'm gonna do, right? Um, all of these things, think about that. A lot of low hanging fruit there because no one's done it yet. For instance, um, a lot of the stuff that I did during my PhD under Martin Monti at UCLA uh, was attempting to use focus ultrasound in disorders of consciousness patients. So this is a big category, but what I'm really talking about is coma, the vegetative state, minimally conscious state. So these are patients that have had brain injuries, okay? They hit their head really hard or they've had a big stroke and they have reduced or altered consciousness. So um, while you know, consciousness is maintained by complex uh, network structures in the cortex and cortical arousal, we know that deep brain nuclei are really important for maintaining those things and coordinating those things, right? But uh, as we'll talk about, they're hard to attack with our uh, current neuromodulatory techniques, right? But all of the successful treatments or somewhat successful treatments for DOC that elicit some recovery can find a home in this sort of circuit model, right? Directly or indirectly, um, implicating these, these key subcortical nuclei, okay? Basal ganglia, thalamus, and we focus on the thalamus very much so. For instance, deep brain stimulation to the thalamus can, uh, the central thalamus can wake a monkey from anesthesia, can wake a monkey from sleep, um, and in at least a couple of DOC patients improve their symptoms. But these patients often have, um, you know, tons of intracranial pressure and they just can't go undergo this type of surgery, right? So the answer we thought, or Martin Monty thought that before I came in, we can use this focus ultrasound to directly attack these nuclei, right? Um, Non-invasively without surgery in these patients. Um, I'm gonna breeze through this, but uh, in general, we see significant trend towards improvement following ultrasound in both acute patients and chronic patients. Acute patients, they've just had an injury, so they're more variable. That's really when you want to treat the disorder because they can get better. They have a lot more potential to get better, but chronic patients from a scientific uh, point of view are better because they're much more behaviorally stable. They've been in, they've had a brain injury over a year ago and they've been um, in the state for a long time. So any change that we see is much more compelling because we can't have a control group. And also I see some fMRI results from this as well. This is in the acute patients alone. I'm just showing a portion of this because it's like, you know, this is like three papers. Um, but I just wanna give you an idea. Again, we see evidence for inhibition during the ultrasound, right? In the target and in some distal regions that makes sense. Interestingly, so, so this is the block design, right? It's comparing the on versus off, just standard fMRI block design. We also see some differences in connectivity when the ultrasound's applied, right? Increases in connectivity, mostly, interesting. And this complex pattern is related to the degree of recovery. So those patients that recovered more, they had uh, a greater decrease in connectivity between the targeted thalamus, just the targeted thalamus, and this like bilateral cortical subcortical patch here and this ipsilateral uh, posterior area, okay? So that's related to the behavioral recovery. If instead you're looking at changes in the untargeted thalamus to the rest of the brain, you see nothing, okay? 
So as a, as a group, this like healthy study I've done, this acute study and a chronic study that's not published yet, but will be soon, uh, collectively, I think it's, is uh, more compelling than any one piece. And I would, uh, you know, encourage anyone to look at the details if you're interested. Before you mentioned that there is a difference between the cortex and the thalamus because of the cell types that are active yeah. or in the And do you know, I can guess what it is at the thalamus? Yeah, I know. Yeah. So it still has to do with inhibitory interneurons as well. That's the theory. And it's the same. Uh, so the model is very similar in that paper, but the cells are just replaced by thalamic excitatory and thalamic inhibitory cells. So it may, so because this beam, when it's deep in the head, right, it's, it's a bit elongated, right? It's more of a beam that it is a single point. And so you are also hitting the thalamic reticular nucleus, which is yeah. right, full of inhibitory interneurons. And that is the theory put forward by this computational study. What I find is reductions in bold signal, but I don't know if that, you know, I don't know what that means on a neural level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds also a bit like a Hebbian influence. A Hebbian influence? That the neighbors are like more. It's not that actually. The how, neighbors. How, how far is this taken into account? Oh, uh, like, like lateral inhibition. Things like that. Yeah. Well, I don't know why that would be, I don't know, because it's a pretty big area that's yeah. being affected. Yeah, it's not that precise. And I, and I think and it's, also it's an interesting spread, idea. Like this shot before, the difference between the water and the skull. Uh -huh. So this distribution could have some influence. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm just thinking that the, it, it'd be too big for local network dynamics to explain that right unless it's like affecting certain cells like this is just totally speculation right it's so like it could affect certain cells differently than others and then yeah you're right like there could be local network interactions that could end up inhibiting you know generally inhibiting or affecting bold signal i don't know like honestly we just don't know you know yeah so i wish i could i could say more but we don't we don't know okay so uh, now I'm gonna get into some of the, the limitations, things that we don't quite know how to deal with yet or you know, remain challenges to this type of research, right? Um, so is it, there's a lot of things that affect the beam properties, how big it is, right? Uh, how accurate it is, things like this, and, um, and affect the transmission of the ultrasound through the skull. For instance, obviously the bone thickness you might want to uh, consider if you're going through the thin temporal bone, right? Or the thick frontal bone here, that's gonna matter. The angle at which you approach, if it's too steep an angle, like sometimes you need to hit a structure that's like a bit under the ear, right? So if I wanna hit the, the amygdala, you kinda gotta go at a bit of an angle, right? Maybe a five degree angle, but any more than that, and you start risking the energy just bouncing off. Okay, so that's important. Uh, the frequency you use, of the transducer, the transducer size, its focal depth, all of these things, and bone density, which is like a really hard thing to measure, unfortunately, but I didn't know this, but people vary a crazy amount in their skull thickness and the density, and the density matters more. So you can't measure that with MRI uh, well, but you can measure it with CT. So anyway, it's kind of this thing that we just can't, we can't deal with, with uh, basic science, but it is something that matters. Um, okay, so yeah, skull matters, right? So for instance, if you've got a big transducer and it's a really shallow focal point, all the beams are converging on this, this really particular point. So this, is, this would be like a cortical target, right? And that's why you can get the super precise effects that you see in cortical targets like the somatosensory or, or motor cortex that I, I talked about in the, in the pig study, okay? Because it looks like that. When you're deeper, you inevitably have to use, um, well, it simply has to be a longer focal point, right? But if you have a smaller transducer or it's deeper, you're gonna have more of an elongated focus. It's like this little sausage sort of shape, okay? That'd be like targeting thalamus right in the middle of the brain, which is what I'm used to, okay? So it's really precise up, down, left and right, but it's, it's more elongated. And so you're kind of also impacting like nearby stuff like basal ganglia. Um, okay. 
also frequency that you use matters uh, not something you have to really think about because it's going to be fixed from the transducer uh, you know to the transducer you buy uh, but good to know right if it's a higher frequency it's uh, more of a local focus if it's a, uh, a lower frequency it's going to be a more wide focus because the wavelength is larger right so the interaction will be more diffuse but interestingly higher frequencies don't go through skull as well as lower frequencies. So there's sort of this balance, right? So uh, diagnostic ultrasound, you use like two megahertz, like one, one to 10 megahertz. But for this, we have to use something that's like 500 kilohertz, okay? So it's like this in-between thing. Um, just throwing that out there for anyone who might be interested. Do you know the threshold point where it gets dangerous? Uh, it's it too hot for Oh, dangerous? Yeah. So for, okay. yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, this is not relevant to that, not too relevant to that is a little bit, but this is more important for, so, so even if it got absorbed by the skull, right, uh, but it was a lot of energy, that might also be bad because the skull would inset heat, which could heat the outside of the cortex. So, you don't, we don't think about this very much for safety. Yeah. This is more for like the transmission through the skull. Okay. So, if you're in animals, you can get away with really high frequency because they got little skulls sometimes if it's like a rat, right? But you want to be super precise, okay? Humans, you got to do this sort of in-between thing because we really fix skulls, okay? Not really relevant to safety, but we'll, I'll, I'm going to talk about that. Okay, so for, for instance, right, targeting a deep structure like the thalamus that I do, um, this is kind of the size of a idealized focal point. Okay, so in water, the transducer that I use, the transducer that, that you guys have, which is 80 millimeter depth, right? The focal point is something like that size. It's just about that size in water, okay? So in theory, you can hit even different parts of the thalamus, right? We can get to that level of precision. Now, and I've done so, that's why I've made this, right? Because I, I've, uh, I'm doing a study right now where I hit the central thalamus and the pulvinar thalamus, they do different things. And I'm interested in that. Um, now, because skull is important, there is some added variability. So it doesn't really look like that. It's more of, okay, there's skull. It's more of like this kind of barely overlapping, like probabilistic cloud of influence, I call it. So it's like here, the darker inner circle is like where is the focal point ide you know, idealized. And this larger circle is me adding what I know about the variability, right? Concerning phone, uh, targeting, using the software, all of that, right? So it's something like this, uh, but you know, it's accurate enough in theory that I thought will we'll, um, you know, we'll do this, right? That I, I'm doing a study with this design um, and indeed, this is preliminary, but I am seeing differential effects uh, between these two regions. This is a different score in reaction time on a, um, on a vigilance task. And so the sham, you actually see nothing at all, right? But differential effects between the central pulp and our thalamus. So if you're really good at this, if you know what you're doing, you can hit different parts of the thalamus, different parts of the caudate or putamen hippocampus, but if you want to maybe hit the, like the amygdala, you're going to hit the whole thing, unfortunately, right? Yeah. So that just gives you an idea of the, of the limitations here. This is like the absolute, absolute max, you know, for this sort of the, the uh, equipment that you have, that's like the maximum, um, like, you know, like the lowest space, right? You could, you could hit two different regions. Okay. So, because of all of this complexity, because of all of these things, what you really want to do is you really want to run a acoustic simulation through a skull model. So if you have thought a lot about um, your design and right, like where I want to enter through the skull, what I want to hit, um, often what people do who are you know, big in this, into doing this, right, will run a simulation like this. They take this really high resolution CT skull, and then you can use this MATLAB program that um, is used for just general simulating uh, sound wave propagation, okay? So, um, okay, so that's ideally what you would wanna do to confirm the 
exact focal properties that you have, that it's not attenuated too much, like there's enough energy getting in the head and that it's not made too inaccurate by bouncing off the skull or being absorbed by the skull, okay? But that's really hard to do, right? So you're gonna have to make a graduate student or something like do this for three months to, to know how to do it because you need to design the whole, like the whole medium. It's really, it's really, really complicated. And you also need like a really good GPU to run it and it'll take a day, okay? So people do this, but if you're getting into this, you shouldn't try to do this, <laughs> okay? But instead, I made something that I'm gonna advertise right now, <laughs> okay? Um, so this is about to be published in plus one. Um, I made this uh, this just simple MATLAB function that you download, just a gigabyte of, of data. And you can input all these things like the fundamental frequency or the, the carrier wave frequency, right? So the sound wave frequency, uh, the angle you're coming at, transduced diameter, et cetera, et cetera, bone thickness, and it'll just spit out an estimate of the attenuation refraction you can expect. So you can just say, you know, uh, Past studies have done similar things. Oh, and they don't get too much refraction. Also, we ran this and we expect this degree of attenuation. So this is what we expect inside the head. And it'll spit out this little um, like images from the closest simulation that I ran to what you input. So you can input anything and it'll interpolate the whole space, but it'll also spit out the closest thing. So you get an idea of what the focal point looks like inside the head. It's really useful in the planning phase, right? Because maybe I don't know what to do. Maybe I'm thinking about hitting something, but it's at a crazy angle. I can play with 10 degrees, zero degrees, 20 degrees, that sort of thing, and see what it does. And it can really matter, right? Like here's some parameters that make sense and here's some that don't, okay? And you look at this thing, we're getting tons of attenuation. It's refracting two centimeters. You know, like the beam is huge or the focal point's huge, all of this. You wouldn't want to do this, right? You might use my, my uh, function, it's called SmartFuss, and um, decide, oh, I don't want to do that. Okay. So starting off, I think that's a, that's a good way to get into the whole simulation business. Okay. So this is the final section, everyone. <laughs> Almost done. Um, so this is what I'm talking about, safety. Okay. So um, we kind of know uh, what the threshold intensity is to obtain neuromodulation from stuff like this, right? We're crossing a certain threshold where most of the time we're getting a tail kick, right, at this intensity. So we, we kind of know the, the lower limit to what is effective, but it's a little bit unclear, it's pretty unclear what the upper limit is to safety. So we want to be in that range, right? We want to be definitely effective, but we don't want to ablate the brain, obviously, okay? We want to be pretty far away from what's used surgically. So what do we know about that? <clears throat> there is this FDA limit, okay? So the Food and Drug Association in the United States has set a, a limit on ultrasound, okay? So a lot of people try to adhere to this, but it's totally meaningless, okay? So what, what they did is in the like 70s, they said, we got to put a limit on ultrasound intensity. And they looked around and they found the highest intensity used by diagnostic ultrasound. They said, that's the limit. So it's nice that we know it's 100% safe, this FDA limit. So people will often just get right up to it and say, hey, let's see, below the FDA limit, it's totally safe, which it is. Um, but it's, yeah, it is definitely far below what is, what is actually the upper limit of what is safe. I think it's pretty subtle in terms of neuromodulation too. Like, like nowadays, now that I have control over what I do, I, uh, I go higher, okay? Um, and also this doesn't govern research. So people for forever, like that 2014 study, the Legon guy, his was higher than the FDA limit. Right, just right from the get go. It doesn't govern research at all. So I would not, you know, ideally, like if you don't know what you're doing, you might listen to this, but if you really know what you're doing, you might, you might not. Okay, but you know, the FDA limit is at the FDA limit is also seemingly neuromodulatory in some situations. Like this data comes from that. This was up to the FDA limit 
But nowadays, um, this guy is about to get more than twice, twice that intensity. And I've done it on myself too. Uh, well, I haven't. This was last week, actually. And so uh, I think so. I haven't talked to him. Yeah, but I think they would have told me. <laughs> I would hope Yeah, because I'm getting it done next week. <laughs> yeah, but I, I have done this on people. and Yeah, they're fine. But I'm getting much cooler effects. <laughs> <Getting me. laughs> I, it's still it's not crazy, right? You know, it's not hey, so it's not like uh, it's not insane stuff, but this is a meditation study and, you know, we're getting more interesting subjective effects than uh, I've seen before playing around with the lower intensity. And let me talk about is some- Is there any uh, that I find with a kind of relationship, linear, you know, whatever, between the intensity and effects? Definitely, yeah. yeah. Well, this is, this is that, right, on the left? And then these are real data. That's real data, yeah. This is in rats, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. So the success rate is how, yeah, if they saw it, yeah. Yeah, that's real data. And there are other examples in, in animals. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's go back to this parameter set, right? This is what I'm using now in, in this meditation study. Okay. Um, now, now this gets a little technical, but you need to understand uh, this. So there's different types of intensity. Okay. So uh, this complicated waveform, right, means that there's a lot of different ways we can talk about uh, intensity and safety. Uh, the main two that we talk about is ISPPA, this top one here, and ISPTA, never mind what they stand for, right? But the PPA, right, this top one is the instantaneous intensity. Okay. It's the pulse average, right? Whereas this ISPTA is the temporal average. So when this pulse is happening, right? That little pulse, when it's happening, 30 watts are being output per square centimeter, okay? But, um, and that is proportional to how likely you are to just cause structural damage, right? How likely you are to just just punch damage right into a cell with the amplitude of the wave. Whereas the temporal average, which is the average intensity over a second, okay? Because it's, it's on 5% of the time, right? Then for every given second, it's 5% uh, average intensity to the instantaneous intensity, right? So it's 1.5 instead of 30. 1.5 is 5% of 30. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. And that's proportional to heating potential because these off periods, these long off periods allow the tissue to cool down, right? So there's just simply less energy uh, put in and, um, and less potential for heating, okay? And it's actually that, that heating that is, is more dangerous most of the time. For instance, the FDA limit uh, for ISPPA is 190, right? And I'm doing 30, which is pretty high for a human study. So uh, you can go pretty high with ISPPA, but the FDA limit for the TA is 0.72, okay? I'm doing 1.5, okay? So that's the more strict threshold. When you do an ablative study, it's, it's probably the heating that is causing the damage instead of the physical pulse. Okay, um, now, okay, last slide, last slide. So now what matters is not what you output, but what's in the head, right? So you wanna understand, you wanna understand, you know, the contribution of skull, okay? So we don't know what this is exactly because everyone differs, but through simulations that you can run and stuff, you can estimate what the, the in-brain intensity is. For instance, this is what I output at the top, and this is my estimate for the instantaneous and the temporal intensity in the head based on simulations that I've run. That's going through the back of the head into the PCC by chance. I just picked one of them, right? So that's important because we need to compare it to animal studies with different skulls and stuff, right? It's all about, the, it's all about what neurons can take. And, oh, okay, yeah, so... 
again, you know, this is like a hundred or a thousand times stronger and ablative. This, um, okay, so this this 2020 paper, Gower et al. 2020, that's the best safety study that's been done so far. Okay, and they went up to uh, with a lot of pulses. They went up to these intensity levels in brain. It's in the brain. Okay. So not five watts, but 10 times higher, 50 watts. Okay, and much higher for the temporal average. Much higher, right? And they found no damage. So all the way up, never found damage on histology. So we actually don't know what the upper limit is because, um, I mean, everyone kind of goes up pretty high expecting to maybe start finding something, right? Um, but they haven't ever quite gotten there, right? So all the safety studies, there's been some incidental things here and there, but they're probably just, you know, they're not related, right? And so we actually really don't know what the upper limit for intensity is, but you know, there's no reason to go there because this range between what I do and what, you know, what they have here, you wouldn't want to get close to this either, of course, right? But that range, that full range is going to be probably comfortably neuromodulatory and that's what you want. And questions? <laughs> Less when before you started, so I would. Make oh, you're going to introduce me? Introduce you. <laughs> okay. I, I think you did yourself. So, yeah. this is Dr. Joshua Chain. He got his PhD from UCLA and spent the last six, seven years, five, six, six, six years, years, years yeah. just doing pioneering work in this field. Mm -hmm. um, questions? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in the long run, can you also imagine that 